politics. Uh, nevertheless, I'm afraid of all of those uh, who are in high positions. Uh, there's still a lot going on throughout the world today. Uh, we have those in, uh, in Afghanistan that are trying to survive, and we have those that are in Ukraine, uh, our brethren. So uh, let's, let's pray for these. Uh, I'm going to discussion in these areas as well. We all want to remember uh, there's a, in areas where 300 personal injuries uh, in Costa Rica and in India as well as in uh, Kenya and we want to uh, uh, pray for their uh, well-being and uh, you know there are lots of places throughout the world where there's persecution going on like nothing we've ever seen.
may we imitate the things that David uh, proclaimed of himself that uh, we don't keep God's word hid, that we share it with all those around us. After we sing this song together, we'll have our uh, contributions. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall be lead. Till every foe is there.
Next on be number 796. 796. We are the light of the world.
We'd ask you, dear Father, today, bless this family, keep them safe, always in you. For all these blessings, Father, we ask your beloved Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we take the Lord's Supper together, we're going to sing in 268, I gave my life for thee. We're reminded of the things that happened on the night that Jesus was betrayed before he was crucified. And uh, that he met with his <coughs> apostles and had this feast of them and provided for them, uh, even though the Jews at this time were taken to the Passover, uh, the Christians just had a, an entire new meeting. And each first day of the week since then, the church has continued uh, to observe this feast, this memorial, to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Paul wrote in his letter to the Corinthians, he said, I for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Let a person examine himself in, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Jesus. 
the door come to cross and just, just what we call it the door come to cross. That was that was God's plan from the beginning. When we were the ones that put him on the cross. Um, but we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And the last thing that Jesus said was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <clears throat> but because of the sacrifice that Jesus made, we don't ever have to worry about saying that. Because as long as we put Christ first in our life and remember that sacrifice, God will never forsake us. So let's remember um, as we take of this bread and kind of this cup uh, this morning um, what that means to each and every one of us and what Christ did for each one of us individually. Lord of all the heaven, thank you for all that you give us in life. And most of all, for your son, who died upon that cruel cross. And we know that if we remain faithful to you, that we will gain much from the cross, from his death, and from those things in this world that can harm us. You have promised to protect us. And we know in taking up this bread, we remember those things which you have done, that your son especially has done upon that cross. And we should, at every opportunity, strive to be here and to serve you as we should and to partake of this bread and this cup. We know that when we partake, we're partaking of a memory, a memorial, of something that's far greater than anything that's ever happened in this world. And that is your Son giving his life for us. There's no greater thing to think of. There's no greater memorial to look at. There's no greater thing in this world to see with our minds and we know that this bread represents much more than we can ever pass. We could only give our own lives for our sins and suffer the consequences that He took those consequences away and suffered for the sake. Please bless us that we can take Jesus' name. Amen.
childhood, maybe your teenage years, did you ever do anything that you didn't really want told or anybody to find out? Especially when you're little and you're running high. I remember one time in kindergarten, yes, there was kindergarten back then. I only had a small cave. Uh, and it was, we didn't take naps, uh, but we did have to lie down on the rug. And right before we lied, lay down, it was cookie time. And each one of us got to eat one cookie, drink some milk, whatever. So I decided that I wanted another one. So I snuck around. I don't know what the teacher was doing. And got to know. Now the basket was a basket sitting on the table. But I couldn't enjoy eating it because I had to put the whole thing in my mouth. <laughs> Trying to hide it. But somebody told on me. I don't remember who. It's been that many years ago. I didn't want her to know, but I got that extra cookie. So I was a fat little chunky boy. Anyway, I like cookies. Adam and Eve were fearful of the penalty of disobedience. They wouldn't have to defend themselves or be held accountable in their mind if they could just hide. They were right in being fearful, but wrong in dodging the issue. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. 1 Kings 18, verse 21. Elijah tells the Israelites present at Mount Carmel to choose who they were willing to serve, Jehovah or Baal. But the people answered him not a word. Can you ever remember being corrected get one of those good old talking to you know everybody was talking to where you wish they'd go get the bell instead why did you do so and so I don't know how many times I've done that why well if you did the same thing you didn't have to defend yourself but if you did say something it wouldn't make any difference anyway so you just did like that why were they so cowardly? Were they afraid of answering in King Ahab's presence? Were they even more afraid of offending the queen? One thing is certain, they didn't fear God nearly enough. Where is the boldness like that of Peter and John when they would later say, we must obey God rather than men? Acts 5 verse 29. They failed to commit themselves because they did not want to wind up on a second place team. We were talking, you talked a little bit about that this morning, about being picked for a team. Well, Brother Scott, I'll give you a little comfort, but generally I was the last one to get picked, too. Remember, I was fat and chunky and full of Oreos. So I wasn't very athletic. Matthew 22 12. Man invited to be a wedding guest was dressed in appropriately without a wedding garment. Whether or not anybody said anything to him or not about his inappropriate apparel is not stated. But when the king saw him, he asked, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? The man was speechless because he had no defense for his actions. Some evangelists have stated, that brethren do not justify a modest dress, mixed swimming, social drinking, things that people don't talk about very much in the church like we used to 50 years ago. They just do. The challenge has been given for anyone to hold a different view to set forth a rationale that will authorize modern dress or any other 
quote unquote socially acceptable thing. I've heard brethren say we must keep up with the times. I have been <coughs> chastised as an evangelist because I only mentioned immodest dress. So in the interest of not being chastised again, I'll mention speeding, eating candy out of the box counter without paying the penny or whatever it used to cost. Some of you don't remember this, but <laughs> the little candy display, and they had a thing where you could pay. Uh, speaking of watermelons, uh, let me think. Maybe some other things. I guess I'm being facetious, but the thing about it is, why should we have to dimension a litany of things that we're not supposed to do when we're just simply not supposed to do them? We know what we can do and what we can't do. Some, many who use instrumental music in worship can't give a coherent reason for its use except, I like it. In so saying, they acknowledge that there is no defense of the use of it. If you ask some brethren for day, today for their opinion, I mean position on issues that the church faces, and these are not my words, I, I copied these words, they become silent as a clam lockjaw. That's pretty silent. Who are they afraid of? Apparently it is not God in the Spirit. Brethren, we know when we're doing something that's not in harmony with God's Word. We most likely don't have to be told. The same response, you'll hear it when many are asked, how can they fellowship a false teacher? Entire congregations of the Lord's church have been torn asunder by the silence on this one thing false teaching and remember where they come from they don't come from without they come from within Matthew 21 beginning in verse 23 and when he entered the temple the chief priests and elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I will also ask you a question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Where was it? Which was it? From heaven or men? And they argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, then why didn't you believe it? But if we say from men, we're afraid of the multitude, for all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you, or what authority I do these things. 23 through 27. Our Wednesday night classes, Steve continues to mention about Jesus being the master teacher. And by the way, a short commercial, if you're not coming to our Wednesday night class, you just don't know what you're missing. Really, really good class. The chief priests and elders of the people asked Jesus, by what authority was he doing these things? He knew they were going to try to turn the question against him. So he gave them a condition to uh, answer him something that he would answer them. They were trapped and knew it. If they answered that John was authorized to baptize by heaven's authority, the next question would Jesus would ask was, well, why didn't you obey him? Since God authorized the message. If they answered that John baptized by his own authority, they feared the crowd would turn against him as they regarded John as a prophet. You mean, if you tell the truth, people won't like you? Oh, imagine that. When you tell the truth, people don't like Therefore, they chose silence. Jesus knew 
that many people were watching him to see if he would heal someone on the Sabbath. So on one occasion, before doing anything, he asked the question, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or evil or save life or to kill? The question is not difficult to answer, but they kept silence. Maybe they didn't answer because Jesus could prove them wrong. They'd have to reason with him and explain their position. And I don't remember a time that anybody tried to reason with Jesus if they came out on top. Didn't happen. They were silent out of fear of being shown wrong. Frequently, people hold to a view based on emotion rather than logic. These people did not even try to defend their position. And Jesus looked around at them in anger. Mark 3, 1 through 5. Another kind of silence springs from fear, but it, all, it involves refusing to say what ought to be said. James wrote in chapter 4, verse 17, whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. The four lepers recognized the principle in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3 through 9. They realized that withholding good news of abundant food from those who were starving would be sinning. Is it possible that Christians are withholding the good news from those who need to hear? What did Jesus command his disciples to do in Matthew 28? Verses 18 through 20. He told them to go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them all the things He had commanded them, which includes the very instructions. Yet some people will say, all that commandment was only for those 11 people. We, we, don't, have to, we don't have to worry about that. Um, did the church understand it that way in the first century? When the persecution became intense in Jerusalem, I got to try to stand up. Was it not the members of the church who went everywhere preaching the word, while the apostles remained in Jerusalem? Acts eight one and four. They did not protest that it was only the work of the apostles to preach. And what was Stephen doing? preaching in Acts 7. He wasn't an apostle. What was Philip doing in Samaria in Acts 8? He wasn't an apostle. Why did Paul write in 2 Timothy to do that the things you have heard from me among many witnesses commit those to faithful men who will be able to teach others also? Did they not understand that Jesus was not only talking to the eleven? And why does Hebrews 5.12 admonish brethren that it was time for them to be teachers, not for them to be fed with milk all over again? Christians can't be silent concerning the gospel and salvation. Excuse me. Neither can we be silent on moral issues. A good example is imperative. Jesus talked about this necessity, excuse me, necessity, that's a big word, of his disciples being salt and light. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. But model behavior must also be accompanied by words. Many people do not know what the scriptures teach about the sanctity of life. They certainly do not know that homosexuality is called a sin when it is violent against nature. Romans 1 26. They will not pick up that information from Oprah or American Idol or any other of those programs. Late night TV hosts are not giving lectures about how sinful adultery is. Christians are silent on the moral issues of any age. Who's going to stand up for righteousness? We're the only ones that can. 
Is it not a sin for us to refuse to speak up and warn unbelievers of the wrath of God, which will surely come upon this world of darkness? And y'all forgive me, but I gotta come out of this coat. Right with God and say nothing about the present evils, though they be among our relatives, our classmates, and our associates. Christians cannot remain silent concerning truth and sound doctrine versus error. Only truth can sanctify Christians. John 17 17. Who is going to tell people that God never authorized denominationalism if we keep silent? How will people resist the errors of premillennialism? Pre I don't know if they ever say that word. <coughs> Calvinism. The difference of, in baptism is taught by the scriptures and is taught by man. Did Jesus revolutionize the world through His example only and silence? Of course not. And neither did His followers. The world in the first century was not turned upside down by silence. We cannot be silent with respect to God and His Word. There is an axiom that silence gives consent. Remember all these examples when morality, when right was brought up and people refused to say anything. This is true in the case of believers who refuse to openly and audibly denounce sin. Now I'm not trying to be harsh and I don't expect you to be harsh. The Lord doesn't expect you to be harsh. There's a loving way to do these things but we still have the responsibility, the obligation and the opportunities to do this. In the Bible, we read that at the stoning of Stephen, Paul, as a young man, was consenting unto his death, Acts 8 chapter. But how did he consent to that cruel injustice? We're told that those who stoned Stephen laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. As far as we know, Apostle Paul never said a word while Stephen was being stoned. He didn't say, stop, what you're doing is cruel. He consented unto it simply by his silence, or long his silence. God does not communicate truth for it to be buried, but to be passed on to others. Can you imagine Andrew not telling Peter that he had found the Messiah. And what would it have meant if the disciples kept quiet about the resurrection of Christ? But when Peter and John were commanded by the rulers of the Jews not to speak any more about Jesus, they said, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Acts 4, verse 20. I hope that we can all say this daily, that we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. We do that through preaching. We do that through Bible classes. We do that through the distribution of the heart-to-heart uh, -heart, through the mails and other ways that we do it. We do it by talking to others. We do it in our dress and our speech and where we go and where we don't go. We have the opportunity to be silent when we're supposed to be silent and to be loud when we're supposed to be loud. And I hope we'll all take that myself included, which I haven't always done. For what it's worth, the lesson is yours. I hope that you gives you a little something to think about. 
the things that we do through silence in our lives. <coughs> if you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins, this would be an awesome day to do that. If you have something standing between you and God, or you and a brother, or a sister, this would be a day to let us pray for you, pray with you, or whatever the case may be. Why don't you let it be known while we stand and while we stand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What will you do with Jesus? A question comes to you. And you must give an answer for something you must do. What shall it be? What shall it be? Thank you. 